Hi, I'm Steve Scott. Thanks for joining us. I'm here with my good friend Bill Montgomery, and Bill is a unique American judo man in many ways, but one of them is that he has trained with one of the great all-time judo men, Anton Gaysink. And he's going to tell you a little bit about that, and I'll ask him some questions, but I'm going to let Bill do most of the talking. Uh, first of all, Bill has been in judo 55 years. He's trained all over the world, certainly all over the United States. He's a sixth on in judo and a legitimate and a good one, and he's certainly one of the best judo men I know. And so I just want to have a little sit down with, with my friend here and, and talk about Anton Gaysink. So, Bill, first of all, thanks for joining me. My really pleasure. Really appreciate Steve. it. Um, you train with the great Anton Gaysink. Can you tell us a little bit about Gaysink and then why we're talking about him? What's the significance of this man? Well, I first met Anton Gaysink at Jim Bregman's Camp Olympus in uh, 1972. Mm -hmm. And. Um, I had the fortune or misfortune to be chosen to be his uke. I had never met Anton up to that point. I knew nothing about him. And our initial interchanges were not particularly nice. He would say something in English and I would do it. And although he had a very large English vocabulary, he didn't really speak English. He did, but things got twisted around. So at one point, I told him, Brethren, Mm -hmm. I said, I'm not going to do this. It was obviously that Anton was not happy with me, and I wasn't happy with him, but I knew very quickly that there was nothing I could do about that. So I told that to Jim, and Jim says, well, let's re rethink this, okay? So there was um, a person that was with Anton named Reen Brower, he spoke really good English. And Jim talked to Reen, and Reen says, I'll take care of it. So Reen talked to Anton, and Anton said, oh, in English, we will do this again. He never said he was sorry, he never said anything like that. So we started doing this mat work drill on the ground. And I soon learned that this was going to be a different kind of okay. And he says, well, I say fight hard, I mean fight hard. So I would do that. But anyway, the, the camp started, and um, Anton disliked people who would ask what if questions. What if the guy does this? What if the guy did this? And there's a story, and he used to say this regularly. Anton would say, if my auntie had something else other than what she has, she would be my uncle. That's not exactly what he said, but children could be watching this. And one day, it was an afternoon session, it was a technical session, and Anton was teaching, you know, school now, your tegurum, he called it tegurum. And he says, Bill, come in on a throw, so I come in on a throw. He picks me up and he throws me, and he's discussing this, and he's talking about it in a very nice fashion. And the guy goes, well, what happens if Bill really attacks fast? And I looked at the guy, oh, <laughs> Anthony was attacked hard. And I think to myself, I'm not going to do this. So I attack, and Anthony says, no, hard. So I come in as hard as, as, hard as my little 195-pound body can at the time. And I smash him on the high, he picks me up, boom, throws me. I wouldn't do that. So the guy keeps asking questions. And Anton is getting more and more aggravated. So I, Bill, come in. So I come in, he picks me up, and he sits me on his shoulder. I've got one leg hanging this way, and one leg, and I'm facing that way. And I'm sitting on his shoulder. And he's holding on, and he's talking. You see this? And the guy says, what if Bill tries to escape? No, oh, Bill doesn't try to escape. <laughs> And Anton's really getting angry. And all of a sudden he takes me and he, like this. He turns me and then he just lets go. He drops me. It's a dead fall from six foot four. Boom. And I went, <coughs> and he goes, what's wrong with you? <laughs> and so he's saying to this guy, you, you should not ask what if questions unless you can take care of it yourself. And I'm not sure exactly what he meant by that because it was the English thing. But that night at Rondore, he goes, Bill, come here. I go, what now? He goes, where's your friend? What friend? Where's Mr. What If? <laughs> I says, he's right there. Mr. What If, come here, please, please, please. Mr. What If. Here, stay here, please. Would you like to do friends, do Rondori with your friend Bill Montgomery? And Mr. What If goes, well, no. And I goes, you're going to. Go. I said, Anton, what should I do? He goes, anything you want. <laughs> I said, he's a camper. He's Mr. What If. 
Well, I was better than this guy, and I did start trashing him, but he was a paying camper. And Jim Bregman sees me doing this from the other side of the mat, and we have nine 30 by 30 mats. And Jim hollers from the other side of the room, William, which is a sign for me to stop whatever I'm doing. And I, well, he comes running over, and Anton says something to him in Japanese. They both start talking in Japanese, and Bregman looks at me and goes, and walks away. <laughs> so this poor guy gets beat up for the next three rounds or five minute rounds. I'm feeling quite proud of myself. And then Anton says, don't thank your friend for the round. So I thank Mr. What If. He goes away. And that was the time when I started to kind of get close to Anton. But when he would teach, he wasn't dogmatic about what he said, but he said it in a very matter-of-fact way, which in in an American society, gives you room to ask questions. Wrong. In European society, you don't do that. You certainly don't do it in Japan. You know, and people will say, "Yeah, you did." Well, when I was with Anton, whether it be in 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 uh, uh, Austria or France or Holland, when he said something, people just did it. Mm -hmm. Well, at this point, let's tell everybody, yeah. Anton Gaysink was the 1964 Olympic champion, open weight, the first, he, he broke the right. broke the barrier. Right. He was the first non-Japanese, and of course, the 64 were the first year that, you know, judo was the Olympics, certainly mm -hmm. for him. He'd been the world champion previous to that. Yes. He was a legend in yes. judo. He was 6'4", what do you say, about 300 pounds? No, he was 6'4", he weighed two, almost 250. Almost 250. Big man. And when he was fighting. Especially in that time. That was huge. Especially in that time. That was huge, huge judo man. Yeah. But he wasn't just a big, strong, tough guy. No. He was an exquisite technician. And he's fast. Very fast. fast. He had the fastest feet you can imagine. An amazing technical judo player. Not only was he the first Olympic gold medalist non Japanese, mm -hmm. he was the first non Japanese to win a world championship. Correct. Which yep. was in 1961. And he beat the great Sonny. Mm -hmm. Right? And then in 1965, he won the World Championships again. Mm -hmm. He did retire after that. But Anton was, uh, I might have this wrong, he was either an 18 or 19 time All-European Champion. Mm -hmm. So he had a little bit of experience. Quite a bit, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that being said, and we, we, we got a little background how you met him, yeah. what he was in the world of yeah. judo. Um, just out of curiosity, I, I know you're a fight fan and everything. How would you rate him um, in in comparison, let's say, as the great heavyweight champions like Jack Dempsey, Muhammad Ali? How would you know? I know it's a personal your bias because you like yeah. the man. He trained with him. How would you rate him in, in world of judo? Would he be uh, a, a Muhammad Ali, a Jack Dempsey, a Joe Joe Lewis? Uh, you know, th those are those are good examples that you know a lot of people know about. You know, I think Anton. I think he would be a Joe Lewis. A Joe Lewis, yeah. Joe, great champion. Yeah. 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 And in his own way, he was quiet. He was not quiet off. He was quiet on the mat. He was kind of quiet around judo people. In a personal level, he was a jokester and all this other stuff. And he was very, but he was very serious. Mm -hmm. On a on a wide basis, as far as judo goes, up until Anton, when Anton came on, he was no doubt the greatest judo player in the world. Okay. He's six foot four. The Japanese had developed a speed film, slow motion film, and they were video, they were taping or filming judo guys, and they wanted to find out how fast they could move through an attacking area. So they had all the big ones. They had Nakatani, they had Okano, and they were showing that the Japanese were far superior. So they filmed Anton. They quit filming. Yeah, he was that good. Anton was moving almost as fast as Okano. It was quite a bit lighter. Oh yeah, he was a middleweight. Middleweight. He was quite at, a bit. At the end of the division, so it was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. The difference is he was bigger, so you could see him. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you can stop him. No. That's correct. And he was very versatile. He could do all kinds of things. Everybody said, "Oh, he's he just he's a rumor." No, not really. He did all kinds of things. And his training attitude was quite frightening. No. And he expected his charges to do the same thing. Oh, yeah, put the back. And I don't think it was anything that Anton did that was particularly different mm -hmm. at the time, except his physical condition. Yeah. 
His physical conditioning was absolutely superb. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about, let's jump in. Because after you met him yeah. at Camp Olympus, yeah. you went over and trained with him in Europe for right. some time. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about Three that, months. how that happened, and the yeah. time, and so on like that? At the second camp that he was at, maybe the first one, I'm losing track now, he asked Jim Bregman if he, if he thought that myself and my friend Larry Thorpe would be interested in going to Europe. And Jim goes, yeah, they'd like to go. He says, but the, Jim says, the coaches, Anton goes, that's okay, I'll take care of that. Now, I did not know this at the time. They had this conversation like that. Mm -hmm. So we were invited to go to um, Europe with Anton for three months. And I'm, I'm just getting into coaching. As you know, back then there was no coaching program. You just right. kind of did whatever you That's right. I'm all excited because I'm going to learn the European coaching. What, what year was this? 1972. Okay, 1972. Okay, got it. Jim Bregman, Camp Olympus, pays for our airfare. Mm. Plus they gave us per diem money, right? And after Camp Olympus in 1973, Larry and I got on a plane with Anton. And we flew up first to Holland, and then we went to, to Munich, and, or pardon me, Frankfurt, then Munich, and then we drove up to Austria. Mm -hmm. And we were to help see if they coached. The coaching tour stopped when we got off the plane in um, um, Schiphol. Anton's comment was basically, you will now learn to be judo coaches, but first you must learn to be, do judo. I thought to myself, I'm not sure I trained for this, but it's going to happen. And it happened. For three and a half months, every Ron Dory session I did, every one, was me against whatever country that person was from. Right? Mm -hmm. After two weeks in Austria, I wanted to go home. I didn't want to hear another Austria. I didn't want to hear German. I didn't want to see another Austria. I didn't want to hear another Strudel. I didn't want to, I wanted to go home. But I couldn't get home. Mm -hmm. At one point, we're doing Ron Dory which we did a lot. And this Austrian blue belt, which is a equivalent to us of a, of a Nikhil, mm -hmm. he throws me. Threw me several times. And Anton goes, Bill, please, please, you are not Santa Claus. Do not give the, do not give the Austrians gifts. I thought to myself, <laughs> the Austrians. Mm -hmm. I took this blue belt and I bounced him up against the bleachers. We were in a basketball court, and the bleachers were all folded up, and there were tatamis all over the place. I mean, covering the whole thing. And I bounced him off the, off the thing, and I threw him. And he got up, and I punched him. I punched him in the head, and I threw him again. <coughs> and Anton comes by, and goes, Bill, 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 do not hurt the Austrians. <laughs> you are their guest. And I thought to myself, mm -hmm, the Austrians. And the battle was on. Every run race has to be like that. Whether I could beat the person or not. They were fighting an American, and it wasn't fun. I had never sat in a place, and Anton said something to the, the Austrian team in German, and everybody in middleweight and below ran to my left, and everybody 209 and over ran to my right. And I went, I thought to myself, oh, crap. And Anton said, Rondere, Schnell, you ever have 50 heavyweights running at you? Because <laughs> they all want PC. So for the next four weeks in Austria, that's what we did. And every run the session was like that. Yeah. And Anton, he never said, Bill, don't do this, don't do that. He said, Bill, do not stop. That's what he said, do not stop. And I was Suzuki okay, even there, you know. And it was, the, it, was, it was a frightening experience, and then you start to get numb, you start to get used to it. But one morning, we ran every morning, we ran these switchbacks up this mountain. Mm -hmm. And then we'd lift logs. He was known for the, the log. The, the famous photo of him carrying a logs. big log. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He, didn't, he didn't like lifting weights. I'll tell you a story about him lifting weights. Though. So, mm -hmm. you know, the alarm, they come over the speaker and they would go, Good morning, da 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 da, da you, know, you know, something to breakfast, bone up a teat, and we get up and go run. But the morning, that morning it was raining. I don't mean just rain, little, it was pouring. I mean, it was like a monsoon. Me and my buddy were laying in bunks. And the windows were all cold. I thought we got to close the window. The judo are all wet. Well, they're not going to run today. We got back in bed. Pretty soon, 
bam, bam, bam on the door, and it's Anton. And he goes, Bill, Larry, the Austrians are waiting. We're like half an hour late. They've been waiting in the rain for mm. half an hour. They're not happy. No. Oh, no, they were not happy. Mm -hmm. They said nothing. We ran out the switchbacks. We looked at the logs. We ran back down. And that morning laundry session was painful. That's all I can say. Tell us, tell us about the, his, his approach to strength training and conditioning, because he, he was unique, especially in that time. Yeah, yeah. He, he developed this whole program with logs. It wasn't, I think he got it from the military in the Second World War used logs for a lot of things, and he borrowed that. And he had this whole circuit, and a lot of it was going around like this, and you throw it up, and you catch it on the other side, and you go around like this, and you throw it on this side, and you catch it. And you're, you know, and that's great, but I was working with the heavyweights, and I'm only 5'10", mm -hmm. and I mm -hmm. soon learned that I wanted to be in the middle, not on the ends. And they would intentionally drop it on my head. First lesson. Not the first lesson, but... So, he believed strongly in that. He believed in doing, like, running in the mountains in Austria, and he believed in running lots of hills, and basically doing anaerobic training through running. Mm -hmm. Short burst, 50 to 100 yards or meters, and then you would walk down, whatever, you'd do it again, you know, and you would do this over and over and over and over. I don't know how many times he did that. Mm -hmm. But then he had something else that he did personally. He said, I do not like lifting weights. It's a waste of time. I like logs. I like exercises. I like, what do you call it? Call it gymnastics. And he talks exercise with your body. He says, but I like lifting, I like doing power plates. Well, Anton, how many, how many reps and how many sets do you do? And he looked at me and he said, what? I said, do you do four sets of eight or four sets of ten? And you, how, many, what, how much weight do you use? He goes, what are you talking about? No, no, no sets. No, no, no. You use 100 kilos and you do it for 20 minutes. Mm. I said, do you do 20 reps? No, 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 my English is better, Bill. 20 minutes! So he's doing power cleans with 220 pounds for 20 minutes. That's what his weight does. <laughs> now you can, say, you, so you, often you can say, well, but it wasn't his whole body weight. Uh, okay, just take 80% of your body weight and go power, do power cleans for 20 minutes. Go, go, be my guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it was frightening, but it was always, it was interesting because he outwardly generally did not get angry. You know? But if you did something, he would say something to you. And at one point in Austria, I was just beat to death. I mean, I just, I couldn't take it. You know? And I was breaking down. I was crying. And this guy, Lush Lushka, took me and he, there were showers in the gym area where we were working out. We normally went back to the cabins, but he took me and he threw me in the shower. And he turned the shower and he sat. He said, sat. Anton's coming. So Anton comes walking by and he looks in the shower. I don't, I don't see all this because he's behind me. And I'm sobbing. So everybody goes out and they go up to the cabin and people have lunch. And I sheepishly go back up to my room and I get changed. And I don't have to take a shower. Everything's wet. And I get into a warm up suit and go out and eat, grab it, and eat lunch. And none of the Austrians say anything. We're talking as much as we can. At the afternoon session, Anton comes up and goes, Bill, the next time you take a shower after, after practice, please take your judo gi off. That's all he said. Mm. What he said is, don't do that again. So, the next morning or something, I don't know. We're doing a Nawasa drill where someone gets you in, in a hold down and you have to get out. You have, at the time, 30 seconds to get out. And Anton puts me with a guy named Eddie Ayelik, who was a multiple Austrian light heavyweight champion. Eddie wasn't the biggest, greatest technician in the world, but he was really strong. Eddie gets me in Kami Shiogatani, and Eddie does not speak any English. Anton goes by and stands on, on, on Eddie and says, Bill, are you listening to me? Yes, I'm listening to you. I want you to get out. Do you understand me? I said, yeah. What he was saying is, if you don't get out, you're doing it with me. I was out in about 10 seconds. And I pinned this guy. And he went crazy. He went absolutely crazy. But when I switched, I got him in Kamishio. 
I reached under his arms and I grabbed as much skin as I could with his gi. Mm. And I held on for dear life. And then something else happened when I was doing Rondor with this guy. And he was trying to break my leg with Hayatoshi. And I stepped over it and I threw him with a kozotogake. Mm. I practiced that for years. I've never thrown anyone before or since with that move, but I threw him. <laughs> and I was trying to knock him out. And he stood up. I got scared. Yeah. And he went. And he went to Lutzlischka in, in, in Dutch, in Deutsch. And I said, no. What's one? Just go, go get somebody else to work out. So I said, what's up, what's up with Ayelik? He says, he thinks you're crazy. He thinks I'm crazy? The guy who broke two legs in the Austrian National Championships last spring? He thinks I'm crazy. He goes, yeah, he's scared to death of you. I said, good. Keep him away from me. Yeah, yeah. Anton goes, I think you should have a little more kazushi with the kosoto. <laughs> That's what I said. But the training he did wasn't much different what we, than what we did, but the intensity was different. And he did vary it, you know? Mm -hmm. You never, re the, the, the practices were always the same as far as you're doing newaza, then you do standing around there, da 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 da. That, that's a good question. So, when you, uh, a typical workout training session, and they were all hard, as I yeah, put yeah. Um, time frame, you know, after you, how much time warming up, how much time did, did you do the Iwaza first, do Chikomis? Tell yeah. us a little bit yeah, about did, that. You warmed up on your own. Mm -hmm. You didn't go in there and put your tape on and then, oh, no, no. You showed up, you have your tape on, you didn't get your tape on. That's it. Too bad. And there was no warm up. It basically was, there was a five, five minute rounds. That's how you warmed up. Mm -hmm. And then you do standing work. Then maybe we'd do some strength drills where you stand and you put your arms out and your partner crawls around you without touching his feet to the ground. Mm -hmm. And then you do the same thing to him. And then you do the pickups that we're doing today. Like that, you do pickups. But then you do it with two people. And you pick up two people. And they are. I, I didn't do very good at that because I'm with the heavyweights. I'm not doing well on that. But anyway, that's what we did. And then, and then we go, Rondore. And you go back to doing Rondore. Five minute rounds. Basically, you had a minute or two between rounds. And most guys could rest. Larry Thorpe and I didn't get to rest. We went every round. Every round. And um, I generally, I kept my mouth shut. I didn't curse at me. I didn't do anything like that. But I would get really angry. You know, I'd get angry with Anton, but there was nothing I could do. Yeah, you know? yeah. And through that whole three-month period, every once in a while, he'd go, good job, boy. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And he didn't do that every day, mm -hmm. maybe once a week. Yeah. Um, and that was, that's not to say we didn't have a good time as we did. Um, the Jew, what, 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 what manner of man was he? You got to know him quite well. Yeah, what, yeah. Let's, let's lead it. What, what manner of man, what type of guy was he? In some ways, Anton was always in the seventh grade. Mm -hmm. He'd pull practical jokes and do things like that. On another level, he was an international diplomat. He was... He he um, he respected other people's cultures. He really mm -hmm. did. Mm -hmm. uh, he was confused by the American culture. But in like, what way? What, what, what? That's well, I'll tell you. Give you example. I was going to mention this. When I got to Austria, Anton never told me to call him sensei or or hair professor or professor or hair gazing. So I, we were at a practice. I said Anton, and the whole Austrian team went. Ooh. Mm. And they were waiting for me to get my ass hit. Oh. Anyway. And. Um, Anton said yes, though. So I asked him what he said, and he told me. There you go. And I found out from Lutz Lushka, he says, no one calls Gazer Anton. This guy. No one. Mm. Had a professor, had Gazing, you know, Sensei, but never Anton. I said, should we stop doing it? No, keep doing it. Everyone's going, how can we do that? Mm. And Anton, we did that at Camp Olympus. Anton goes, this is what the Americans do? Eh, it's okay. Mm. But his training, that he did things like he did a lot of things that you would do in a country that does soccer. He did a lot of stuff, not with balls, but with your feet. Mm -hmm. Because you play a lot of soccer, your feet are good. Not naturally. Not naturally, but they become good. He tried that at Camp Olives, it didn't work. Because all our kids play American football, so he had this thing like arms are locked together. Mm -hmm. And in Holland, the kids come around and kick him piece of his feet. And this country, our kids go, and bash through him. He's going, what is that? Mm -hmm. 
It might be different today because soccer is such a popular sport now. But right. back then, right. back we're talking yeah. 1972. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, he, he would, I never heard him be denigrating to the Japanese. I never heard him say that. Mm -hmm. He did say that some of them he did not particularly care for. Mm -hmm. But that's what he said. He said that about some Americans, too, you know. And he, he said things like, you know, you have to be proud of your country. This may sound like nothing, but, you know, you fight for yourself, but you fight for your country. So you have to be proud of your country. Why do you all speak, to, why do you all count Japanese? Do you speak Japanese? Well, no, you know, I speak Japanese. I prefer to count Dutch. And he would count in Japanese at Camp Olympus, because we all did, but he was a very interesting guy, and he was... In a lot of ways, he was very, um, not unassuming, but he could be, he could scold you without beating you up. Mm -hmm. there, in the judo practices themselves, he could be extremely brutal. And not go ha, 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 just that's the way it is. He was very mm -hmm. matter, almost matter-of-fact about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. But his judo itself was unbelievable. I mean, the guy could move. You know, at the time, he was two years, well, he's four years out of competition, and he could move like a middleweight, you know. He wasn't this plodding behemoth that people talk about. No, that wasn't it. He was fast, he was agile, you know. And, but he did things with people's heads. Well, I think we should stop this at this one. I'll tell you a story about the 64 Olympics. He finds out where the, where the Japanese team is training in the morning. He gets there an hour and a half before they show up. He's running to do all stuff. When they get there, he's sweating. He's all done. He goes, oh, good morning. I'm glad you finally got here. See you later. And they're going, just little things like that. He would mentally destroy you, you know, or try to. On the other hand, he was very kind, but he would pull jokes. I mean, he was a great, he was a terrible jokester. You know? Have you ever seen a match burn twice, Bill? <laughs> and he burned with the match. You know? Come on. Get to it, you know? But, you know, it was a great tour. I learned a lot. And I learned, it wasn't, it wasn't what I learned technically. It's what I learned mentally. You know? mm -hmm. And that's what it was about. When I got back, and I was only there three months, I went to, well, first place I stopped was in D.C. I went to Bregman's Dojo. And Jimmy Martin was just like a 20-year-old kid at the time. Middleweight Jimmy Martin, middleweight went to Pan Am Games yeah, yeah, and yeah, Sambo, yeah, yeah. great, great Sambo judo player. Yeah. And we did Ron, we did Rondre in mm -hmm. the morning. We did Rondre in the morning. He says, "What do you want to do? Let's just do Rondre." So I went. I did start on the ground with him, you know. And my groundwork was never that good. And I'm just, I'm just crushing it, and crunching. It. Let's go stand up. So I start throwing with the left Hayatoshi. And I'm not throwing for a full point, but I just keep throwing. I'm coconutting to death. He goes, "You don't do anything else?" I said, "Why?" <laughs> And I didn't realize what, how I was saying it. You know, and he was training at Bregman's at the time. I heard him say to Bregman, he goes, he's crazy. Jim goes, nah, not yet. He didn't stay there long enough. <laughs> but I he went, didn't stay in Europe yeah, long enough. Yeah. Okay, yeah. But I went back to Omaha where I was teaching judo for a living. I had one of my students who I really respected. She had a long history. But she said, Bill, you come back from Europe, you're speaking with an Austrian accent. And you're beating the crap out of us every practice. I said, no, don't be honest with that. Yes, yes, you are. Mm -hmm. I said, whoa. And I was. I just didn't. My, my level had changed. And my mental uh, whatever had changed. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize it, you know. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine if I had survived four years what it would have been like. I, I have no idea. You know? right, right, right. But after, after, after three months, I wasn't right in the head. You know? mm -hmm. It wasn't that I went out and just beat people up intensely. But my level of judo had gotten better, but I was very, I was very hard. You know? mm -hmm. I took everything personally. You attack me, you're going to pay for it. I attack you, I'm supposed to throw you. I don't, you're going to pay for it again. You know? mm -hmm. it, was, it doesn't make any sense, but that's what it was. Really? Yeah. But, you know, you, you are, it, is there anyone else besides you and Larry Thorpe that had done that and no. experienced it? No. That was a very unique experience, very unique time, actually, in American judo history, you know, and, and, and our formation Anton, of it. Anton would have done that for other people. Mm -hmm. He was never asked. Amazing. It was because of Bregman. Mm -hmm. You know, 
Bregman knew him from Japan. Not, they weren't great friends. Don't, don't misunderstand me. They trained in different places. But and Jim knew him from Japan. All the expats from all the other countries, they knew each other. They may not like each other, but they all knew each other. They, they, were, all, they were all training in Japan up to the, up to up the to, Olympic up Games. To the Olympics, yeah, sorry, so yes. they all knew each other, the Americans, the right. Dutch, the, the Germans. Germans, you know, they French, all knew each yeah. And so Bregman brought him to Camp Olympus. And people, well, how'd you do that? I says, well, I found his phone number and I called him up. <laughs> What'd and you do? Ask him how much. He said so. He says, do you want to come? Yeah, sure. Send me the air ticket. So that's what we did. That's all? Yep. That was a little bit more than that. But that was basically it. And it was because of Jim mm -hmm. that Larry Thorpe and I got that introduction. Anton would have done it for other Americans. Mm -hmm. um, Real quick note about for our viewers, Jim Bregman. Uh, first American to win a world uh, championship medal and in judo and an Olympic medal. So clearly a, a, a legend in, in American judo. Your main sensei for yeah, many years. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the connection yeah, there. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. But Anton was just... Oh, the other thing is to tell you what he is, it was in Europe. There was no common market at that time. So every time he went from one country to the other, you had to show your passport. Well, we're riding with Anton, right? So we come, to, we come from the... First one we go through is, uh, we, oh, we're going through customs at Schiphol. Then I'm going to come with me. Anton, no, no, no. So we go down these stairs, around and out the front. Never went through customs. Mm. That's no big deal for Anton. In three months, it's going to be a big deal for me. We fly out of Schiphol, we fly to Frankfurt, we went through customs there. And then we went down to Munich. And then from Munich we drove to Hintermus, and from Hintermus we drove to Italy and into France. And after we left France, we went through France, and went through Belgium, and into Holland. All those places I just mentioned, my passport was never stamped. I went through customs at something at JFK with the Dutch. And they, so when I came into England, when I was leaving, I went to Heathrow, and I went to, you know, go through customs, and they were checking it. The guy says, where's your bed? He's looking at my passport. He says, where are you? I tell him, you know, he says, you've been, this says you're flying in the air over, over Skipold somewhere. I don't, I don't know. So they take me in a room. I tell them what happened. And they go, oh, sir, you can't do that. You have to, you're not, you know, you have to, I, I didn't know. And Anton was like, we would go to a border cross. And they go, either Monsieur Gazing, Senor Gazing, oh, get down over he was, he was well known. Well, he was, well known all, all over Europe. A celebrity. Oh, a celebrity. Yeah. If you wanted to write him a letter, you're right, Mr. Anton Gazik, Holland. And it would get to him. And it would get to him. Yeah. He was, he was a national hero. Yeah, he was. He was. You know, we, uh, today, we're, we're talking about the 60s. Judo was big in, in the Netherlands. Huge. Huge. Yeah. And he was a national celebrity and remained so for many years. Yeah, yeah. Remained yeah. so and yeah. became a member of the IOC and, yeah. and other things. Yeah. Uh, so anyway. Bill, thanks a lot. It's been a, you, a, a great, great pleasure. You know, I always enjoy visiting with you. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, when you tell these Anton Gasing stories, I love hearing them. And I thought yeah. other people might, too. So I, I hope think you really enjoyed it. You know, it was an experience. Yeah. And took very unique. Very unique. Very unique. You know? And you're, you're one of the few Americans ever. Huh? Yeah. Two, yeah. two, actually. Yeah. 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 I mean, don't get this wrong. There were people that went to his dojo, okay? And they would visit. Most of the time, they would visit once and never come back. Right. right. It was not a dojo for middle age. So. It's kind of fun because, you know, uh, I was always a fan of Gay Sink. I never got to meet him. Uh, here, a good buddy of mine was a student of his. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's great to talk to somebody yeah. who had that interaction with him. So. It was only three months, but I'll tell you this on a, on a sad note. When he died, I was distraught. I had that one. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I was really distraught. Um, I never thought he had that much of an influence on me. Yeah, but, but he, he did, did. Yeah. yeah. It was great, you know. Great, yeah. great. Again, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for that. Okay.